Hello again, I'm Chuck Todd, and welcome to another episode of Meet the Press Reports. Today we're going to look at the secret war on terror that the United States is quietly fighting across the globe. What are the front lines in this war, you ask, on terror? Is it Afghanistan and Iraq? The average American might be able to name those two countries, but few know the actual extent of this country's global war on terror. A 2022 report by the Brennan Center for Justice found that the United States has fought secret wars in at least 20 countries over the past 20 years. One of them, Somalia in East Africa. TV cameras have never been allowed to embed with U.S. Special Forces there until now. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby recently returned from Somalia with a behind-the-scenes look at this tense battle against the Islamic terror group with ties to al-Qaeda known as al-Shabaab. Courtney, what'd you learn? We learned quite a bit, Chuck. Uh, this deployment to Somalia began just over one year ago, and it is so sensitive that, as you'll see, we've had to blur the faces and withhold the names of some of the key players. In confronting al-Shabaab, the U.S. Special Forces and their Somali partners are facing an uphill battle against one of the strongest, most brutal terror networks in the world. The name al-Shabaab may not be familiar to many American ears, but their attacks are well known around the world. It's an urgent fight against one of the world's biggest terror threats, al-Shabaab, an arm of al-Qaeda that has been terrorizing Somalia for nearly two decades. Their targets, citizens, government officials, and diplomats in southern and central Somalia, even attacking civilians in neighboring Kenya and Djibouti. The terror group is the largest and richest al-Qaeda affiliate. They overpower the Somali forces in sheer number of fighters and in weapons and equipment. The terror network has shown no mercy in trying to topple the government and take over the country to establish an Islamic state. We embedded with U.S. forces training the Danab, elite Somali military troops, as they participated in live fire drills, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and learned how to face their biggest threat from al-Shabaab, roadside bombs or IEDs. Counter IED training takes place here, which is very important in Somalia. This is the senior enlisted Navy SEAL in charge of working with the Somali troops. We cannot identify him for security reasons. IEDs are, pose a significant problem, so some of our troops provide that support as well. And basic marksmanship, uh, patrolling tactics, you know, small, small unit warfare tactics. Officials here say as many as two of every five of these new Danab soldiers will be wounded or killed in combat. About 350 recruits graduated today. They're now Somali Special Forces, and dozens of these men and women will be on the front lines in the battle against al-Shabaab in a matter of days. Including a handful of women like Second Lieutenant Shukri Yusuf Ali. Yeah, it's giving women opportunities. That's a very big opportunity. That's something like we're proud of. At 21, Ali was one of the first females to join the Somali troops. Now, at age 24, she's seen combat firsthand. I, I wasn't afraid at all. I would actually go again. You would go again? Yeah. Are you, do you think, do you see yourself staying in the military for your entire career? Yeah, since it was a hobby from childhood, yes. And I see myself going up. This graduation, a harsh reminder of al-Shabaab's brutal tactics, including assassinating political and military leaders. At Baladogle Airfield, a former Soviet airbase, where the U.S. trains the elite Somali Danab forces, the training camp was officially renamed after Major Hassan Tour, targeted and killed earlier this year by al-Shabaab. His death is driving the Danab to fight even harder, and for U.S. troops here, it was like losing one of their own. It's almost like losing a teammate, you know? Um, I never thought I would say that in my many years, but I've come to really be proud of what the Somalis are doing. I haven't seen this in Afghanistan or Iraq. This mission is not unique to Somalia. Small elite teams of U.S. military special operators are working with local forces around the world, fighting al-Shabaab in Somalia and East Africa, battling ISIS in Iraq and Syria, and ISIS offshoots in Afghanistan and into Pakistan, and combating the spread of al-Qaeda's ideology through a number of terror groups and affiliates in West Africa. This is a much different U.S. military presence than the presences of the past in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Chris Mayer focuses on special operations and counterterrorism at the Pentagon. These are not large combat deployments, and they're focused principally on empowering the local partners to deal with the threat themselves. Do you see these small groups as, as more of the norm going forward to take on terror? 
I would say it already is the norm because we don't have large combat formations like we once did of hundreds of thousands in, in some areas that Americans are familiar with in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. Is this a, di a dangerous mission for the U.S. military? Absolutely, it's a dangerous mission, but I think one we take with well uh, conditioned and, and well considered risk. The Somali government has vowed to drive Al Shabaab off the land they control, but their military is too small to hold areas after they're cleared, leaving local militias to police the newly freed land, often with no training and armed only with their own personal weapons. The African Union provides almost 20,000 troops and helicopters to support the Somali military, but their presence is now scheduled to end in late 2024. Ambassador Mohammed El Amin Suef leads the African Union mission in Somalia. So those localities, the remote area, there is no rule of law. Suef says the country will still need support after Al-Shabaab is pushed out of areas. There is no uh, governance, there is no, nothing, in, in, including, I mean, uh, the basic uh, infrastructure. So what we are doing now, and we appeal the international community to support the Somalis once they liberated uh, some of those localities. The Somali government has asked the U.S. to train more Danab, as many as 5,000, and to lift an arms embargo so the Somali military can compete with their well-equipped, well-funded adversary. In addition to training, U.S. troops provide critical support to the Somali troops, including surveillance from overhead drones and airstrikes. This exclusive video shows Somali forces taking back territory that al-Shabaab once held. This is the Joint Operations Center. The video was first seen here, where the U.S. military monitors drone feeds of Somali special operators during missions. When trouble arises, the U.S. can provide support with airstrikes. There's very deliberate considerations and a checklist that we take into account before we provide this requested support to defend our partners. Decisions like these made by the commander of the U.S. Special Operations Task Force, East Africa. We cannot identify him for his own safety. As live fire drills blast in the background, he tells us he turns down more strikes than he approves, often to avoid civilian casualties. One strike won't win or lose this war. Mm -hmm. But one bad strike will take that authority and capability away from us um, and have ramifications that impact not only us, but also the international community that's here supporting Somalis. He knows that often means not being able to help the Somalis he works with every day. It is tough. It's something I think about um, every day. Uh, like I said, it's, a, it's a, a human aspect of this job that we all have to take very seriously. Another human aspect, the population here is vulnerable. More than 90% of the country's wheat comes from Russia and Ukraine, which remain locked in a fierce war, putting Somalia's food supply at risk. And for months, the country has been suffering from its worst drought in recorded history, destroying crops and killing more than 3 million livestock. Today, nearly half the population of Somalia is starving. To make matters worse, as the Danab clear an area, the fleeing Al-Shabaab fighters burn the crops, kill the livestock, and poison the wells, leaving locals on the brink of a famine. Is the world doing enough to help the Somali people? No. Larry Andre served as U.S. ambassador in Mogadishu until May 30th. We need the other rich countries, traditional uh, partners of Somalia and uh, uh, those who have not traditionally uh, supported Somalia during times of drought, to step up uh, as the American people have. Without international help, Somalia's food crisis could turn into a full-blown famine. The threat remains. So we really need to see Somalia's partners, traditional partners, new partners, respond to this human tragedy uh, and uh, bring about the, the uh, support that is necessary to keep famine at bay. As they do in Somalia, U.S. troops in Syria face risks every single day. The mission to stop ISIS from growing its next generation of fighters, many living in camps like this one, the Al Hall refugee camp in northeast Syria. In 2019, when ISIS collapsed, thousands of family members of captured or killed ISIS fighters fled here. Now, some of these refugees enforce the terror group's brutal rules inside the camp's walls, kidnapping, raping, and beheading those not loyal to ISIS. There's more than 50,000 residents here at Al Hall. The vast majority are women and kids. And with overcrowding, poor sanitation, and at times shortages of food and water, this population is extremely vulnerable 
to violent extremism from groups like ISIS. ISIS is certainly trying to prey, uh, prey on, on this population. We met Major General Matt McFarland here. His troops support the local Syrian Democratic forces who secure this camp. Do you think that this camp is secure right now? I think the camp uh, is secure, but there's opportunity here for ISIS to foment its violent uh, ideology. Camps like these are breeding grounds for ISIS to recruit and train fighters, even growing an army of young boys loyal to the terror group. Meanwhile, the roughly 800 U.S. troops in Syria helped the local Syrian opposition forces secure this camp and the roughly 12,000 ISIS detainees held in prisons, all while battling the ISIS fighters still on the loose. Are these missions having a real impact on these terror networks? I, I think they are. I think we're seeing on a regular basis these networks being really attrited. In Somalia, Ambassador Andre says the small elite U.S. military units are having an impact, supporting local forces who are fighting terrorists there so the U.S. doesn't have to face them at home. We know that al-Shabaab has killed Americans. They have, uh, uh, they have uh, as an al-Qaeda affiliate, they aspire uh, for attacks on the homeland. Uh, so this is in our interest and it's in Somalia's interest. So we have a shared objective uh, shared goals, shared interests. And Courtney QB joins me now. Courtney, the first time we heard the name Somalia, at least for certain people of a certain age, was back in the first term of Bill Clinton, 1993. Have we have we had American forces basically there since then? No, not okay. at all, in fact. And, and, and I think a lot of people would be surprised exactly what the makeup is. So we mm -hmm. focused a lot on the U.S. military forces, these small elite special operators who are there working as trainers. But there's mm -hmm. actually a lot of U.S. US contractors there as well. Mm -hmm. One thing that I was surprised by when we were in Valadogle, which is the, this former Soviet airfield where they right. do a lot of this training, there's quite a few U.S. contractors there doing some of the hands-on training. Is this a proxy fight between the West and Russia in a lot of these places? Is How involved is Russia in some of these spots? We're going up against terror groups. Are, are the Russians kind of helping behind the scenes too? There's definitely a proxy war going on in Syria. It's not so much the case in Somalia. Okay. Right there, it's more of a case of there is this very dangerous terror network that as of now they've been really focused on the region specifically East Africa but they are wealthy they give they give tens of millions of dollars to core Al Qaeda every year and the concern is that they could eventually move outside that region this we have operations all over the continent of Africa and there's a lot of these sort of groups with ties to Al Qaeda all over different regions of Africa um, is this basically how we're going to fight this war on terror over the next get decade or two? Yes. In, in, in a word, yes. I, I don't see there being large footprint conflicts in Africa involving U.S. military. And it's not even just the footprint, too. It's the fact that the U.S. military is really staying behind the scenes in a lot of this. Now, I will say, there was... Not an all I of its training, right? There's more. They do airstrikes. They do some surveillance. In fact, there was actually an IED strike mm -hmm. that hit US, the U.S. military in Somalia this week. Mm -hmm. There were no injuries. There were no casualties. But it does show that just being there does obviously present some sort of a danger to these military. And uh, what's the legal justification? Is this all from the original... Uh, AMU, AMF. AUMF, yeah. yeah. It, so a lot of it is still from that AUMF that's more than two decades old now. And remember, I'm sure you know, there are members of Congress who have been actively pushing back against trying to get that repealed unsuccessfully. So still. they're there in Somalia because somebody attacked the World Trade Center. As in a word, yes. Again. Courtney Cuby, great reporting. Glad you're home safe. Thanks. So are these secret wars legal? Are they the right approach to countering terror? Not everyone thinks they are. We're going to tackle those questions when we come back. Welcome back. It's been nearly 22 years since America was attacked on 9-11. So is the secret war on terror working? Not everyone thinks so. California Democratic Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health and Global Human Rights. And she wrote this in December. The United States and the international community have poured billions of dollars into fighting terrorism on the continent with bleak results. Extremist violence in Africa has increased by 300 percent in the past decade and violent events have doubled since 2019. So... Is America's secret war on terror effective? Joining me now is former CIA Director John Brennan and counsel at the Brennan Center for Justice, uh, a different Brennan, by the way, no relation, is Catherine Jan Ebright. Catherine, welcome. John, uh, it's good to see you. Catherine, let me, let for some definitional, uh, for the purpose of our conversations, how are you, we, how are you defining a secret war? Uh, so I, I think the core of it is 
Uh, first, does Congress know mm -hmm. uh, that hostilities are taking place uh, on any basis, whether active and ongoing or mm -hmm. on notionally like one-off or episodic strikes right. grades? Um, the other question is, does the public know about it? And I, I think at base level, the public needs to know when, where, and against whom the United States mm -hmm. is fighting. And the current authorizations that we have yeah. uh, for the war on terror, uh, the scope of which is defined by the president, right. uh, they do not have clear limitations right. um, in terms of when, where, against whom. John, do you have any, uh, any beef with that definition? No, I agree that there should be as much transparency as possible mm -hmm. about our terrorist, counterterrorism operations right. worldwide to the extent that we don't compromise operational security. Right. And I think administrations over the years have tried to balance the need, in fact, to be able to make sure the American public are aware in broad strokes about what's going on, while at the same time not doing anything that's going to jeopardize the security and safety of our forces. Let me bring up a re uh, I want to say recent example. It's been now six years because John McCain was alive then. But this was early in Trump's uh, uh, presidency. Uh, we had some soldiers die in Niger. And so we learned a lot about what we were doing in Niger. And Congress didn't seem to know a lot. Take a listen. Do you feel the administration has been forthcoming up to this point about what happened there? Of course not. We are co-equal branches of government. We should be informed at all times. But I didn't know there was a thousand troops in Niger. Why haven't you been briefed? Was Jack Reed briefed? Uh, no, I don't believe he was either. The Constitution says Congress has the power to declare war, and if you're in a long-term war, Congress ought to keep that ability. So, John, walk me through how in Washington Congress can be briefed and not realize they've been briefed. Because well, I'm guessing that's probably what we're what we're seeing here. Well, I think there are two things. One is this took place during the Trump administration, and I think there was a real lapse in terms of the protocols and processes and procedures during that time. Mm -hmm. But there are 535 members of Congress, and not all of them are privy to the details of these types of military Three people activities. We highlighted there were well, people that you would yeah. assume, like McCain was always on Intel Committee. I think he was a standing member for that. And, Schumer's the leader, so those guys Yes, they know. should be kept informed, which is yeah. part of their oversight function, and it's up to the Department of Defense and related agencies to be able to make sure that the, con the members that have that congressional oversight jurisdiction are kept fully informed. But clearly there was some type of breakdown there. But they need to be able to keep them informed. Congress establishes the legislative parameters mm -hmm. of these activities. But once they establish it, then they need to be kept informed about what is actually happening. How many troops are going out there? What types of activities are they involved in? What type of collaboration and cooperation are they uh, engaging in with uh, partner forces around the globe? Catherine, what do you think we've been too in the dark on? Uh, so again, those core questions, when, where, against whom mm -hmm. uh, have we been fighting? Um, but with respect to Niger in particular, the activities of special operations forces uh, working, quote unquote, by, with, and through foreign partners, mm -hmm. um, those programs where we may be even commanding foreign partners, putting them on a U.S. payroll, are highly classified. Very few members of Congress are actually directly informed about this, and mm -hmm. uh, the information that their offices are, uh, or rather that the Armed Services Committee uh, is receiving, uh, is classified at such a high level that the member offices um, often cannot access uh, those right. notifications or reports. Is there a success story where a secret war, I mean, we know what the general mission is, counterterrorism, but we don't know a lot about it. What's the best example of this policy working? Uh, so I, I do want to push back on the premise of that, okay. uh, which is to say if there is a secret war, there are not clearly articulated, publicly articulated mm -hmm. objectives. Um, and while in the counterterrorism context, the objective would be uh, potentially defeating or deterring a terrorist organization that is working in that region, um, what the success story would be, it, it simply is not going to be a matter of the public record. Right. Um, and moreover, moreover, in the context of the war on terror, we've had Department of Defense officials march into Congress and say that their work quote unquote, by, with, and through foreign partners under the same authorities that are currently right. being used in Somalia, they'll say these are such effective authorities. We've seen, a, you know, a thousand plus killer captures of various terrorists. Right. Um, but then if you go and you try to FOIA information about how many terrorists have been captured or killed under these authorities, the Department of Defense will say we actually don't collect that information. Okay. John, answer that question. Why don't we collect that information? 
Well, I, I think we do collect some of the information. Again, the question is what is publicly released and what needs to be kept sort of mm -hmm. within government environs. Right. But I do think the ultimate metric of whether we've been successful or not is taking a look at the lack of attacks against the U.S. homeland here over the last 20 two years almost. The fact that we have done such great work against Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP in Yemen, the fact that we've done and dismantled most of Al-Qaeda's infrastructure in Afghanistan, Pakistan, ISIS is not what it used to be because of the work in Syria and other places, and Al-Shabaab has really been, you know, contained in that area of the Horn of Africa. Is this what success, I mean, I remember, boy, when it first started, the language, war on terror, global war on terror, there'd be this debate, you can never win against terrorism. There's always going to be terrorism. What is that? Be careful using that phrase because you're never going to end that kind of war. Is this the best we can hope for, which is successful whack-a-mole? Well, I think what you try to do is to reduce the prospects for these types of attacks against U.S. interests as well as against our friends, partners, and others overseas. And I think we have been successful in that. But I do think it's not just engaging in counterterrorism activities and operations. You're trying to build up the infrastructure in these countries yeah. so that they can, their intelligence, security, military services, their political system, they can rid themselves of corruption that really eats right. away at these systems. So this, again, is a multidimensional effort that has to take place over many, many years. It seems like, I don't know if there's any part of the permanent five at the UN that doesn't have troops in Africa, right? We have somebody is dealing with some problem in Africa. Uh, is this, what is it about? Is it just too many unstable governments? Is that why all of these Al Qaeda proxies have had such success sort of getting some inroads? Well, I, I think you do end up with vicious cycles mm -hmm. uh, where we have had, the French have had, uh, the Russians have had uh, various. Uh, military forces operating in Africa mm -hmm. uh, for the past, again, a decade to two decades. Um, and once you have this foreign presence, uh, notionally trying to stabilize mm -hmm. uh, a, a country or a region, uh, people in that region or in that country are going to look at that and say, well, why are there foreign interveners? Yeah. Why do they think that they know how we should be governed uh, or, or how our security apparatus should look. Right. Why are they pouring in weapons as well into our country? Um, and, and maybe we should push back against that. And so there are documented examples about how the U.S. presence in various African countries have actually spurred recruitment mm -hmm. for terrorist organizations. Let me ask you this, John. Is there an anchor, you know, it, South Africa or Nigeria, can either one of them be the anchor countries here that could sort of lead on security, even if they can't do it all on their own? I think they have to assume a larger role, mm -hmm. and I think that's what the United States is hoping is going to happen. But there are a lot of the countries in, in Africa where there are just endemic problems that really undermine the ability of the host governments as well as external forces to be able to mitigate some of these terrorist threats. The United States doesn't want to absent itself from the continent because then we'd be seeing that We have, unfortunately, and we're trying to work our way back in. Well, think, at right? different times, yeah. I think, we, you know, our presence has ebbed and flowed. Right. And I do think the presence in Somalia and Courtney's piece, which was very good, I think really Really tries to explain what the U.S. military is trying to do there, working with, I think, a government that is better than it has been in quite a while, a president who is committed to trying to address some of these uh, inter-clan rivalries and issues. And so what we need to do is to be able to enable and empower some of these Somali forces to be able to assume a larger role. But it's going to take time. There's going to be some trade-offs. As Catherine said, there's some people that point to our involvement there right. as a reason to maintain their side of the fight. So again, this is something the administration has to grapple with. Catherine, what's something we should look for? We know Congress wants to write a new war resolution. That obviously, we know there's enough people who will accept the premise that we have to do these, do these one-off um, interventions, whatever we want to call them, with special forces. What's, what's that war resolution going to look like? Yeah, so... Uh, there are questions about, is this effective? Mm -hmm. Is this increasing stability in the African continent? Is this uh, actually supporting the national security interests of the United States? Um, and that's all a matter of policy. But as a matter of law, right. right, Congress is the part of government that holds the reins on when, where, and against whom our nation is at war. Um, and there is a law from 1973 end of the Vietnam War called mm -hmm. the War Powers Resolution mm -hmm. uh, that was really meant to put the reins on, on the president, the executive branch, which had spread the Vietnam right. War into Cambodia and Laos under the radar. Um, that law, however, across administrations right. has been systematically dismantled, undermined, watered down. Um, and what this movement in Congress now looks like mm -hmm. um, is 
patching up some of those loopholes, for instance, right. the word hostilities was never defined in the War Powers Resolution. And so executive branch lawyers sure. said, unless it's a full-blown war, right. uh, we don't need Congress's go-ahead. John, what's your biggest concern, that the war resolution goes away with nothing that replaces it, or something is too, uh, is still too, uh, too, too ambiguous? Well, I'd like to see the executive and legislative branches work collaboratively on putting together a framework that really is going to govern our military activities and operations globally. Period. Uh, period, <laughs> yes. So, but there has to, again, be a recognition that the administration has to be the one to execute those policies and those activities and operations. Uh, but so it, it, in a, enabling the administration to be able to take actions against terrorist groups, working with partner forces, but again, setting limits on it so we do not get involved in a lot of secret wars that, again, members of Congress yeah. are unaware of, and the American public is also just fully under, unaware of. We need to have a, a, a balance of, again, transparency, but it, as well as some secret activities. So need some trust again. Public needs to trust the government. The two parties need to trust each other. Good luck with Congress that. and President <laughs> in the presidency, and that's something I think is harder than all of it. Thank you both. Appreciate it, and thanks you all for being here. Uh, next episode, we're going to take a look at the idea of a living wage. What is it? What does it take to get by in America today? Obviously, it depends where you live. I'll see you next time on Meet the Press reports, and of course, I'll see you this Sunday on Meet the Press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.